Okay, here we are in Camden, New Jersey with Jen. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good. Um, so, um, what's your living situation currently? Um, so basically, I'm just living on the streets right now. Um, I had an apartment with my boyfriend, but obviously he wants me to stay clean in order to stay there. But obviously this is how insidious this disease is. Um, I actually had a year and a half clean before um, I lost my mom and actually grief played a big part in uh, my addiction as well and not dealing with my mental health led to my addiction. Um, and like I said, how insidious this disease was. You know, I'm living out of a suitcase. Uh, you shower when you can, you eat when you can. And those things are provided by your family as long as you stay clean for the most part. Um, and my mom was my biggest supporter before um, she passed. Um, and I have a lot, still a family, supporter, friends and whatnot that want me to get the help, but the disease does the otherwise. And uh, for me, I had, you know, time clean and whatnot. And every single time my runs got shorter and shorter. But this last time I just, I can't get it right. Um, I've been doing like the detox shuffle, which actually there's been a couple of times where I've tried to get inpatient help and that was not available, um, especially due to not enough funding or depending on the county you're in, um, especially getting into sober livings. Because for me, like that was when I got the post time clean was, you know, transitioning from a rehab into a sober living and taking suggestions and whatnot. Um, so I actually had went um, to a couple of different detoxes over the last couple of months and they were never able to, you know, push me through to at least like a day program. Um, and then, you know, there's other places where they just do the detox. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the detox shuffle, you know, just because you go through detox doesn't mean you feel 100% when you're, when you're out. You know what I mean? Sure. So the relapse rate's high if you just go to detox and come out because when you start to feel like crap because, you know, obviously you're medicated while you're in there. A lot of places over-medicate so that when you, you know, come out, whether it be a day or two later, you start to feel like crap, and what's the best thing we you know? You know what I mean? Right, you go back high. to what worked before. Absolutely. Sure. Um, this is not fun at all. Um, and obviously, we do things that we don't want to do, and our nevers become true very quick. I mean, if you would ask me five years ago if this is what my life would have been, I would have been uh, Before my mom had passed, I'd never been homeless. I never, you know, tried to hustle out on the streets to make, you know, ends meet. And unfortunately, you learn quick out here that you can only depend on yourself. Because Absolutely. Because we're all addicts and we all have tendencies. Um, for me, it's a learning experience because I wasn't used to that. You know what I mean? Right. Um, I was used to recovery friends who actually had your back, followed through on the world, you know, didn't, didn't uh, turn their back on you. I mean, I still have a lot of close friends in the recovery network because of the time clean I had. Um, so what if you took that one step further of depending on yourself to get yourself clean? Without, Every single without time rehab, clean, I did it for myself. Okay. Um, without rehab, it's hard. Oh because, sure. Uh, you need that, like I said, like, that shuffle, that time away. Like the greater time away you have to get your mind clean, like clear and stuff like that, it takes a long time for your brain to go back to normal. But as long as you're taken away from the drink or drug, and you're in a facility where you can't really do anything but deal with it, the more time clean, from my experience at least, you know, the more time away from the drug, the greater the sobriety. So if you were on a deserted island, you think you could go clean pretty pretty quick? I mean, what? I would try everything <laughs> to try to find that drink or drug, yeah. to be honest. Oh, sure, right, yeah. right. But um, if I was on a deserted um, island... What I'm getting at is, is pulling you out of the, out of the access I mean, area yeah, absolutely. Would, would, absolutely. would make a change. So could you do that for yourself, get you out of an area where the, the drugs are so easy to get? Yeah, absolutely. I was never out here running amok. Like I was, I you know, I'm from a small town in Camden County where all I had to do is pay, take the pack go right out here. Whereas before, that's what I would do. Um, and then you know I'd have a car, I'd gain a car in sobriety, and then I'd rent the car out to the block, and then the car never came back. Everything I gained in sobriety, I lost pretty quick. So how, how long have you been homeless out here? Uh, so, um, I mean, I, you know, I feel bad for some of these people. They've been here for a very long time. Sure. For me, I'm new to it. Um, I actually lost 100 pounds since October of last year. So Friday, I put on weight, so I was 230. I'm 130 now. Wow. Um, and like my brother and family knew right away just by looking at me. They were like, you know. Hmm. You know. So um, my family, well, what's left of my family and my mom's friends and whatnot, they actually, you know, would do interventions on me. But unless I want to get clean at that time, it's not going to happen. Absolutely Every right. Every time that I've gotten clean time, I have turned my will over and been like, all right, I'm done.
tires running, you know, but it's never been this bad before, you know. I never physically stayed out here. I physically stayed out here because I figured, screw it, I know if I'm not clean, my brother and, you know, my nieces and everybody that aren't allowed to see my nieces. I haven't seen my nieces in months because my sister-in-law and my brother keep them away, and they're one and two, um, and they're really the only blood I got left. Um, this disease is so insidious, I do believe it's hereditary. My father died when I was nine, he was an alcoholic, and I had cirrhosis of the liver. So I do believe that the gene was like put in me, and then once I put one in me, it was like off to the races. All right, but now your body knows what it's like. Right, and I've been in and out of treatments for the last 10 years. So you're speaking to someone that's never done drug, right? right? Um, what does it do to you? Like, what is the appeal? It takes away the numb of all the pain that you have. So basically, from my experience at least, I try to numb the pain from everything that I've dealt with, whether it be trauma, abuse, whatever the case may be. You literally just try to take yourself out of that pain, but you end up screwing yourself even more by doing so. And how does it, how long does that painless last? Like, uh, all it does is get worse. Uh, but I mean, it, it, your 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 brain's telling you, go ahead and do this. It'll right. it'll soften the the previous experiences. But how long does that soften? I mean. What, what is the lifespan of, of, you're on heroin, is that what it is? So how long does, does your high last? Not long enough, you're always chasing it. Well, I mean, give it minutes. Mm. Well, when you shoot heroin, it lasts for about that five second quick high. Right. And then it might take you out of any physical pain you may be doing, which a lot of people are addicted to pain pills and they turn to heroin. Sure, that absolutely. That unfortunately is right. the name of the game. Um, I don't know. I'd say the fentanyl compared to what opiates used to be lasts a, uh, lasts a whole lot less. Uh, it's at, like I feel like it gets out of your system way quicker. Whereas it's weird though because fentanyl lingers, but you're not still feeling it. So like you're sick ten times faster by this fentanyl than you would be. Um, I know that I went to five different sets before I went to treatment this last time, and all five I didn't pop for one opiate. Um, and now they're doing car, drank, uh, car tranquilizers, which literally make people into zombies. So the difference between, you know, when I would do like regular fentanyl where it give me a little bit of energy, I'd feel the rush. As soon as I do the car fentanyl, it's like I can't even keep my eyes open, I'm falling all over. Whereas, from some guy I know is literally over there like beatboxing, singing Looney Tunes, walking through the abando, and he has no idea or conception of what he's doing. Right. Yeah, I don't, and for me, like the car fentanyl, I do that, I can't watch my back. And I learned quickly out here that you kind of have to bend for yourself. Absolutely, we've talked to plenty of women that were, you know, just get too deep into it and find themselves passed out and wake up oh, a couple yeah, hours absolutely. later and they have, everyone's picked through everything they've had, you know, so. Absolutely. They, they, you know. Oh yeah, I've had family drop off clean clothes for me to get a treatment. And within 24 hours, I hit it where nobody was, nobody see me, nothing. It was up in an abandon already picked through. Right. Which for me it was hard because all the clothes that I had had was when I was from weight, you know, I was way heavy. I didn't even notice how much weight I had lost until I physically tried to put those clothes on and notice. Right. And also people see it quicker than you. You know what I mean? So, whereas you know, it's in sobriety, you're relaxing, you're eating. You know, for me, I liked food when I got sober because you're always in the diners after the meetings and this and that. You know what I mean? Right. Um, you learn to, I mean, form better habits hopefully, but sometimes. Obviously, I'd rather be heavy than with a needle. Um, so at this point, I, are you ready to are you ready to get clean? Are you waiting so on I something? I literally just left AMA um, from a place in New Jersey um, because the mental health aspect wasn't there. Um, we had alcohols also seizuring, you know, and they weren't being medicated correctly. Whereas alcohol and benzene, which all you can die from, um, or how you were treated. Um, a lot of these people that work in these facilities, um, especially techs, they're not necessarily just addicts, but you know, you people that aren't, they're so quick to judge if they're not. Oh, because they're book smart, they're not experience right. smart. Sure. Well, yeah, absolutely, but you don't have to have any experience to work as a tech. Right. And for me personally, those techs, they may be really nice and everything else, but they don't share the same quality. And a lot of addicts in these places are afraid to, you know, say that, or they're not allowed to then there's that disconnect. But I mean, you got people coming from all different walks of life, all different ages. Mm -hmm. um, I know that almost every single day, and what, there was like 37 women, almost every single day almost, there was fights breaking out. 
over stupid stuff. But you gotta remember, it's because the mental health isn't being dealt with. Oh, everyone's on edge, and everyone's like, irritated, so for me, sure. personally, over-medicated. So then what, like day three, which I was blessed because any other time I prayed that I would get the inpatient time. And with COVID going on, at this place specifically, I thought I was only getting two weeks. They were even 28 days because COVID automatically. So I was blessed with that. But I didn't run with it because day three or four came about and I didn't feel good. And it took four days to see the doctor. And then it took three days to fax over the script. And like in the meantime, paperwork gets lost and it takes longer. So I literally waited a week and like say somebody who came in behind me, right? So for that person, they weren't diagnosed with depression or anxiety before the addiction in life. A lot of people know coming in that they've been diagnosed. Like for me personally, my mom tried to get me out when I was nine until my father died from this disease. And I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, high school, you surround yourself with a lot of people and you just happen to have that gene. And it phases, you know, from the weed to the alcohol. I mean, it, it goes. So for me, it started off with the pills and um, hanging around the wrong people. Sure. You know what I mean? And other addictive personalities. Uh, it's crazy. I, I, I prayed for that time. And uh, as soon as I started not feeling good and was on day four of not sleeping uh, because, you know, the paperwork got lost or the doctor works another job. She's only here on Mondays and Fridays. Wow. Nobody wants to hear that. And I have to sit there and advocate for myself, be a suicidal, and literally tell them, like, listen, I'm going to go out here and I'm, I'm going to die simply because I can't get the mental health part that I need. Somebody who came in the day after me, seen the psych within three days of being on the inpatient thing, whereas somebody who was there three weeks was about to discharge and never even seen the psych. Whereas me, I was telling them, I wish I was never born, that I wanted to be with my mom, I didn't want to be here. And nothing was done about it. Wow. So, for me personally, because I've had experience with treatment facilities and stuff like that, that's my cue to leave. I said to them, I sat here and I suffered on the street. Why do I want to come into a facility where I'm supposed to be out? Now, I'm not drug-seeking while I'm in this facility. I'm asking for the mental health needs that I need. You right. know what I mean? Well, you, you have to look at it from their point of view, too, because oh, a lot of people are going in there drug-seeking, you know? Absolutely. So they're self-diagnosing and, you know, themselves. And a lot of people in maintenance in this and third. And from my experience, um, I did the methadone maintenance. After my mom died, um, I relapsed and overdosed five times in one week. I had never overdosed before. Wow. So... Yeah, it, it, it wasn't fun. And uh, for me, anything was better than what I was doing. So I looked into the clinic. And guess what? People say clean up the clinic. People, you know, do really well in the clinic. For me personally, I looked at it as, well, I had to come off this drug, but now I'm gonna have to come off this drug later on in life. Some people say they're gonna be on for until they're 80. Me personally, having to wake up every morning and having to take something, along the same lines as me having to wake up and going to get my fix so I'm not sick. Right. You know what I mean? And then you get caught up in the game, you get caught up in the hustle. So they start dealing drugs. Money and everything else. It's not worth it. At the end of the day, you're going to do it. And they don't have people that want to do it. So then the junkies become the dealers. And they just do their own supply. So it's like a revolving door. Right. Sure. Um, there was actually a girl that passed away. I was in detox. The city that I was in, her family was actually able to call in as long as they had the password to get an update on it. So thank God for that, or my family probably would have thought I was dead. Hmm. So thank God for my brother knowing that he would be the next kid he would get. So literally this person, I, a coworker I know that's in recovery, called my friend and whatnot and said, listen, um, I don't know how to tell you this, but Jen's dead. Well, I guess the girl looked a whole lot like me and ran two blocks away from where I was. Oh, wow, well, right. And I, fe- I found that out when I, I called home and they had said that. Nobody wants to hear that. You know what I mean? And thank God my brother knows that like, ah, this isn't right. And thank God my family knew I was in there or they would have really thought I was dead. And how would they know? They wouldn't. Right. Unless they physically came out of here, which I don't know about anybody else's family, but my brother's not going to come out of here. He says he's for me. He's going to wait for me to be ready because he knows that I'm going to do things my way and on my time and nobody's going to me do any of them. Every single time I went away to treatment, besides the first time, and the time hit, like right after my mom died. It wasn't happening because I didn't want it for myself. So, do you? How much sleep do you get? None. I haven't slept in seven days now because I literally just got out of um, the treatment AMA two days ago. 
Okay. I was in there for what? Five day detox, and I was in there for like seven or eight days into the actual facility. Wow. Yeah, and you can tell that the mental health isn't being dealt with because you see everybody act out. You see 20 year olds arguing with 40 year olds. Like I said, everybody comes from different walks of life. So imagine putting a whole bunch of addicts that literally went their way into one room. It doesn't work that well. You gotta do what you gotta do. Some places are really well. Manage it. It all depends on the people you're around, too. All right. Well, I appreciate the interview. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.